looking forward to Sony's lab at the Mine Institute in Sacramento at UC Davis. And so we were curious to see if droplet digital PCR could detect 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. So 22Q11DS, I'm going to call it 22Q from now on, um, has a prevalence of about 1 in, to, one in 2,000 and 1 in 6,000 live births. And it's quite common. It's the second most common chromosomal abnormality after Down syndrome. And so it's due to a hemizygous deletion on human chromosome 22. So the majority of individuals um, have a three megabase deletion that encompasses about 60 known genes. Um, a smaller number of individuals have a nested smaller 1.5 megabase deletion that encompasses around 30 known genes. And the rest of the individuals have atypical deletions throughout the 22Q region. And so here I'm just um, giving a rough schematic of chromosome 22 and the 11.2 region. And so here is the common 3 megabase deletion and the nested 1.5 megabase deletion. And here in purple are um, low copy repeats, or LCRs. And so they consist of pseudogenes and genes and also of lots of repeats. And so it's thought that um, these repeats cause mispairing during crossing over and thus lead to deletion and sometimes duplications. And so there's extreme phenotypic variability in these individuals so that um, siblings and even identical twins have been reported to have slightly differing phenotypes. Um, there are very common symptoms such as craniofacial defects. This um, syndrome is the most common genetic cause of cleft palate. Also, there are a lot of cognitive and behavioral impairments seen in these individuals, such as OCD and ADHD. And these individuals also have, um, typically have lower IQ. There's also an increased incidence in neurological and psychiatric problems. Uh, children tend to show padromal schizophrenia, and adults have a 30% risk of developing it. You also see autism spectrum disorders. And congenital heart defects are also very common, uh, commonly seen in these individuals, and that's what I'll be focusing more on. So CHDs are the main cause of morbidity and mortality in these individuals. So cardiovascular malformations are present in about 60 to 75 percent of individuals, and actually a good majority of them require surgery at birth. And this is the most common genetic cause, the second most common genetic cause of congenital heart defects, um, second after Down syndrome. And so conotruncal cardiac defects are the most common types of CHDs, and these are outflow tract defects, so basically anything that has to do with the great uh, veins and great arteries of the heart. Um, so we digested our genomic DNA with um, MSC1, and this was to in, um, induce proper droplet formation. And so then we added that to the TACMAN reagents and some proprietary, proprietary um, uh, assay mix. And then we loaded that mix onto a cartridge with um, some special DG oil. And we placed that into the droplet generator that would then dro generate droplets and um, therefore allow many thousands of discrete measurements to be made. And so then we transferred that emulsion onto a 96-well plate so that we could run it in a standard thermocycler. And so then after PCR, droplets now contain zero, one, or more uh, templates so that the droplet reader can read the fluorescence amplitudes and analyze the droplets via a binary system of um, yes, the droplet contains templates, so it's considered positive, or no, the droplet doesn't contain um, templates, so it's considered negative. And so copy number estimations can be calculated off of the fraction of positive droplets using uh, Poisson statistics. And so a question I get really frequently is um, qPCR versus DDPCR, and why does qPCR not work for us? And so actually, before I um, ran DDPCR, I actually had run some of my samples using qPCR to determine um, their CNV status. And so just really roughly, um, this is the 22Q region again. And I have in red are the eight assays that I've used that I'll explain in more detail later. And so green represents my results um, from qPCR, and purple represents my results from DDPCR, positive indicating that that region was present or minus indicating that the region was hemizygous deleted. And so in the first sample, it looks like this individual has a large distal deletion. 
but I know that this result isn't quite right because I know that the samples that come to us uh, have been diagnosed as 22Q from a fish probe to this region, so this should be a minus. For sample two, it looks like uh, this individual has interstitial deletions throughout the 22Q region, which I know, again, is very ambiguous, um, gives us ambiguous results because individuals with 22Q tend to not have interstitial deletions. They tend to have a contiguous region that's deleted. And then for sample three, it looks like this individual has a 1.5 megabase deleted region, but it's hard to say where the endpoints are. And you can tell that um, the uh, DDPCR results are pretty uh, straight across the board, and as I'll show you the numbers later, they look way more re reliable and robust. And so basically, um, DDPCR is not dependent on standard curves, and it gives you a real value that you can calculate. Um, the measurements are at endpoints, so even one positive droplet gives a strong signal. Just repeating what's been said. And there's also no need to run replicates. Um, this is a really good diagram showing that. So this is just one sample that has been run in triplicate. And so you see the values. These are the copy number variation values. So they're all very close to each other, 1.96, 1.97. And so Quantisoft, um, BioRad's um, software that allows you to calculate all these, also allows you to merge your single wells into one data point. So you can see that these numbers are very similar to each other. And so I was involved in two projects. First, we did a validation study to see uh, the feasibility of using this methodology to detect 22Q, and then also to see if we could um, determine the deletion endpoints in our sample of individuals. So I'll first go over the validation study. So we're interested in using this methodology to detect 22Q. So the current uh, method of diagnosis is by fluorescent in-situ hybridization, or FISH. And so I'm sure everybody knows it's very you know, time consuming and requires really specialized um, equipment and labor. And so we want to see if the QX100 could uh, be a faster methodology to detect these deletions. We also want to see if we can identify deletion endpoints. So what is the type of deletion that these individuals have and where, where are they located and how big exactly are these deletions. And so we used um, 20 samples. We used DNA isolated from whole blood. And so we blindly screened these samples to see if we could differentiate between um, 22Q individuals and control individuals. So TD represents control or typically developing individuals. And so this is really important to us because we want to be able to diagnose these individuals um, really fast and really cheaply. And we also um, would be interested in seeing uh, how, well they, how well we can map the deletion endpoints. And so again, here's a schematic of chromosome 22. The assays in red, or the, um, the font in red are the assays that we chose. And so I chose them based off of their location to discriminate uh, between the 3, point, the 3 and the 1.5 megabase deletion. And so for assay design, um, it was very similar to uh, standard PCR. And so here I just have one of my um, target assays and the control RPP30. And so here we're just trying to determine the uh, proper annealing temperature, and you can see it's really easy to uh, find the best temperature. Another way to see if your assay is optimized is to look at the 2D amplification plot. So we have one target um, assay that, it, that has a fan probe, and our reference has a hex probe. And so as mentioned before, you have your negative droplets clustering here, uh, droplets that don't have any target or any amplicons, and then you have your target um, containing droplets amplifying high in the FAM channel. The same goes for the um, targets amplifying the HEX channel. And then you have your double positive um, <coughs> amplicons amplifying over here. And so we know that our assays are uh, well optimized because our clusters are very discrete um, clusters. And so here I'm just showing um, that we were able to determine a TD individual very easily. So 
the um, green and the blue dots up here represent the concentrations in copies per microliter, and the orange here represents the copy number of values. So a TD, a normal individual, should have two copies of all of these um, primers. And we were really easily to differentiate an individual with a three megabase deletion. Um, the copy number drops very uh, severely down to around one. So this individual is deleted from ProDH to D22S936. It's really easy to find an individual that had the smaller 1.5 megabase deletion. Um, we also found an individual with an atypical deletion that starts at tuple one. And we were also able to find an individual with a duplication. So this individual has <coughs> a duplication at ProDH, as indicated by the copy number uh, three right there. And so in total, we found um, five individuals that had 22Q, one individual that, had, that was normal but had a uh, duplication at ProDH, and um, 14 normal, completely normal individuals. And so basically, we were very easily able to differentiate between 22Q individuals and control individuals, which we were very excited about. Um, we also found some unexpected findings that uh, it was hard for me to detect via uh, qPCR. So one individual had an atypical deletion, one individual had a duplication as well. And so we concluded that DDPCR can correctly and efficiently identify these CNVs in these individuals. So now that we have um, determined the feasibility of using this technology, we wanted to examine the endpoints. And so um, a lot of studies have looked at end deletion endpoints in these individuals, but the, the, um, the sample number weren't, wasn't very large, and also they didn't include phenotypic information. So we, have, um, we looked at 77 individuals, and we characterized them as 34 having severe CHD, so individuals who needed um, surgery, or 43 individuals who didn't have any CHD. And so, again, this is important to us because we would like to see if the deletion breakpoints do indeed localize within the LCRs. It makes sense that it would, but there hasn't been any real conclusive study to look at it. Um, we also want to see if there's a correlation of the size or location of deletion with CHD, and that would help us to identify or confirm certain candidate genes. And we also are interested in identifying individuals with atypical deletions. So here is just a, um, a view of the literature um, in which uh, these studies found um, certain individuals with these types of deletions. And so I've only designed primers to identify individuals in this region, but you can see that there are a lot of other uh, distal deletions that occur here. And so, um, and so our results we found um, Again, all 77 individuals did indeed have 22Q. We saw that the majority, 71%, had uh, the large three megabase deletion with endpoints seemingly in D22S936 and ProDH. We found four with the smaller deletion, and then we found two with atypical deletions. So we were also interested in multiplexing because when we're trying to diagnose individuals, we want the methodology to be cheap and to be fast. And so multiplexing would decrease costs and also increase the amount of information per well. And so we chose um, two probes or two assays, one comped because it was, it's deleted in the majority of individuals. And then we chose PIK4CA because it would help to differentiate between individuals with differing types of deletions. And so um, basically here, we have the two probes again. One is labeled with FAM and the other is labeled with HEX. And then for our reference probe, reference primer, we labeled that with um, half FAM and half HEX. And so we've seen these drop blood clusters before, but now the reference um, probe, because it has half concentrations of each probe, the, it would move the cluster into the middle. So you get a whole new discrete cluster that you could easily threshold. And so here I'm thresholding um, this 2D uh, amplitude plot for COMPT. And so you see the, four, the five clusters that were mentioned in the previous page, and then new clusters have come about depending on the different 
um, proportions of probes that are in those clusters. And so you can see that it's really easy to threshold these clusters because uh, they're very discrete and defined. And so for PIK4CA, the 2D amplitude plot looks exactly the same, except now you want to threshold it in terms of the hex channel. And so our results were very conclusive. We could really easily pick out between a 22Q individual and a TD individual for both the COMPT and the PIK4CA uh, primers. And so basically, um, our samples are representative of the 22Q uh, population. We got about, we got a huge majority having that large 3 megabase deletion and about 5% having the small 1.5 megabase deletion. Um, we found one incorrectly labeled individual. So in our database, we had him lab the individual labeled as 22Q, but using DDPCR, we actually found that it was actually a TD individual. So it just demonstrates the robustness of this system. We also were unable to find a correlation with CHD. Um, this is probably because we had a small sample size and also because the large majority of our individuals had the same sort of deletion. So we would need to run more samples for that. And we were also able to perform multiplexing, which is really important for us um, to perform diagnostics for these individuals. And so um, throughout my process um, in running these samples, um, I found that it was really easy to set up and read a standard 96 well plate in a few hours. And I could comfortably run about two of those plates, so about 192 samples in a day. Um, it was also a pretty simple workflow, and it cost about $3 per well, so it was definitely very cost effective for our purposes. And so um, we've concluded that DDPCR is able to give high resolution CNV characterization, allowing for, fast, inexpensive, for a fast, inexpensive approach to identify deletions and our duplications. And so I'd like to thank the Tassoni Lab. Um, for giving us the samples and for giving me this opportunity, and also for Biorad for giving me this opportunity. Sticky, does anybody have questions for me? Were you able to analyze any blinded samples? So yeah. all these you had prior knowledge whether they were fish positive. Yeah, so we had, um, in our sample set, we had TDs and all, uh, controls and we had 22 cues and so I knew that they were 22 cues um, but I didn't know I didn't know which samples were which I knew that they were all mixed up together and so these were basically all blinded and then were, were there instances where the fish was negative and the 22 no. cues your test came from yeah so fish is still the gold standard yes it is yeah Um, I'll try. Okay, so so our thresholds. Um, sometimes the thresholds do um, change, even though we're running the same assay. But I don't think that that's really an issue for you because the clusters are honestly really well defined. And so um, if you once you figure out what um, types of uh, target or amplicons are supposed to be in those clusters, then it's really easy to threshold them. And so... <laughs> so, so the software is designed, it expects four clusters, and there's an auto algorithm which will um, cluster appropriately to find your positives and your negatives. Once you start to multiplex, you have to put it into manual mode. And as Vicky was suggesting, once you, you know, understand or have an expectation of where you expect your droplets to land, you can literally just draw a lasso around those droplets and define it as a positive in either the FAM channel or the big channel or, or a double positive. And so once you've classified the droplets, the software does a cal the math calculation for you and gives you a concentration. So there's, there's two modes. There's an, there's an auto algorithm and there's a manual mode. I was just wondering, have you tested um, really uh, complex dirty samples? 
So we have, um, so we have, you know, background for the group. Um, my group uh, does demonstrations for potential customers, and some of the customers, uh, one in particular, was actually looking at lake water, and um, they're looking for Asian carp, um, presence of Asian carp in the Great Lakes, and their samples are considered very highly inhibited, and um, weren't did not amplify. And some of the master mixes for real time that are specifically designed for inhibitors. However, in digital PCR, um, it's very, very good at handling inhibitors. Um, we're still trying to figure out why. Um, there's a lot of theories on why that might be. But overall, the, the chemistry itself is very um, robust to dirty samples. Have you heard of Squirt before they've adopted the system as well and they're, they're developing protocols on it? You know, I'm testing the API. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, are you at Stanford or? Yes, I'm a, a postdoc at Department of Engineering. So I, I test the UPCR system from a high bio system. That's so why I want to know, compare the two systems. I, I can't invite you to the Snyder Lab. They don't work at the Snyder Lab. But, um, you know, obviously you can talk with David about getting gain access to um, trying to run some samples and just doing a side-by-side -side comparison. Question. Um, so, for the QPCR experiments, do you also restriction digest them? No. So, I believe that the restriction digest here is required just to fragment your DNA into small enough pieces so that the droplets can be made appropriately. So, just looking at the data, it looks like um, the number of positive droplets is quite, quite a lot. So, I'm just curious why QPCR didn't work. So, um, so QPC, my QPCR probably didn't work just because, um, just due to the, maybe I, maybe my assays weren't designed, designed optimally or um, it just wasn't very efficient. QPCR tends to be different with, difficult with copy number variation because of, as she mentioned, efficiency uh, will affect how the assays perform. Um, and your results won't necessarily fall on an integer. I think what we find with digital PCR is that the results fall very closely to an integer, essentially. And you can distinguish between five and six copies, seven and eight copies, which you just cannot do with, with real-time uh, real PCR, because you're really limited to, uh, the resolution is really, it's logarithmic, so you're, you're limited to really looking at doublings, essentially. Uh, you can get down to 10% discrimination with digital PCR. I have one quick question. So this is a pretty common genetic disorder, and you mentioned uh, uh, siblings that one had a three megabase, one had a 1.5 megabase deletion. Uh, I was wondering, presumably these are two normal parents that yeah. had these children. Um, is there a, if you have one child with a deletion in this region, um, is there a higher chance to have a second child? Is it completely just random that they had bad luck and had two children? Yeah, so in that case, it seems like um, both parents, or their parents were, one of the parents at least was affected, because 90% um, of these cases appear de novo. So it would be really rare. So the parent carried the smaller, the larger deletion? So, I mean, it's, it's possible that one of the parents had a, I mean, they didn't go very much into detail about the parents, but it's possible that one of the parents had the large deletion, another parent had um, the smaller deletion. I mean, especially nowadays when you have like a lot of conferences where a lot of these individuals um, get together and learn about the their syndrome, they can meet quite easily. Alternatively, would be interesting if, let's say, one of the parents normal the other has the smaller deletion, passes on the smaller deletion, and also some of the deletion. There's another explanation, but if they one should really track down those parents. Yeah. That's what's interesting. So, thanks again, Mickey. We really appreciate you coming down here and share this with us.